Hello all and welcome to this new video blog, uh, something I thought I'd try from this year 2015. So a happy new year to you all firstly. Um, I'm Ptolemy and I'm currently a master's student at Edinburgh Napier University doing wildlife biology and conservation. Um, I graduated in BSc honours in animal biology. So a huge interest in nature, wildlife, um, plants, fungi, especially like my birds, as you'll probably find out over um, certainly either this first uh, video blog or the upcoming ones in the next few weeks. Um, also, like my wildlife photography, I like to love uh, get outdoors and I do like my sport as well. Anyway, focusing on this blog, uh, I want to start off as we've just ended one year uh, 2014 with a short brief roundup of that year for me. So it started with my honours project uh, which I actually did on Gentoo penguin mating behaviour at Edinburgh Zoo. Yes guys we're involving penguins straight away, it's still cold here in Scotland um, so it probably seems a, a good subject to start with. So Gentoo penguins, third largest species of penguin in the world behind the king and the emperor penguin these are found on the surrounding islands of the Antarctic, such as the Falklands, uh, Kerguelen, um, and South Georgia. Now, this is a species which loves to collect pebbles to make nests. Instead of huddling together or burrowing like other species of penguin, it, like its closest relatives, the Adelie and the Chinstrap, will collect pebbles to make nests. So what I was looking at was the aggression involved with this. The pebbles are collected to create the nest and then lay their eggs. And at Edinburgh Zoo, uh, to allow the penguins to do this, the keepers there will put down nest rings. So I was looking at the change in aggressive behaviour between before uh, the nest rings are introduced and after the nest rings are introduced. And I actually found out that aggression increased, which is probably no surprise. Um, I looked at aggressive behaviours such as uh, pecking, um, beak open behaviour, beak pointing, and also uh, even up to chasing, which is probably the most violent, as uh, you see handbags in football, well, you certainly see uh, worse than that in penguin colonies. Anyway, um, this happens right through the breeding season, which in the southern hemisphere obviously goes from about just before spring, right through into the summer. So here in the Northern Hemisphere, it goes from roughly February time to um, July, August, when the chicks hatching and are growing up. But that's obviously in the Northern Hemisphere where captive birds are kept. Penguins being a Southern Hemisphere bird, you just imagine the opposite of that. They're an interesting bird at Edinburgh Zoo. There's a colony of about 70. But they can live in larger colonies, numbering up to about 500. And obviously there's a lot of competition for space. And this is one of the reasons for aggression. You're trying to protect a mate, you're trying to protect eggs, you're trying to even protect pebbles, as this is giving a firm basis to make a nest. Um, also when the chicks hatch, you're wanting to protect. So I expected an increase in this aggression as the stakes became higher and higher. But also, there's many studies that have found that testosterone and other hormones that uh, cause aggression do increase at this time. Whereas at other times of the year, birds would be spending most of their time in the water. Whereas, of course, breeding, they're mainly on land and fighting for space. So that was a really interesting start to the year. I also joined up with Edinburgh Natural History Society. Now this is something I'd really recommend for people in Edinburgh, a great group of people who have an interest in all aspects of wildlife and nature, from fungi to trees to other plants to birds to insects um, and mammals obviously. They've got a um, broad range of people from the youngest like myself and um, a few other younger people and students to those who are very experienced in the field and also actually work either interested in natural history or actually working in the area themselves. 
So I'd really recommend wherever you are, whether you be in Scotland, the UK, anywhere in the world um, watching this, I'd recommend get along to natural history groups that are in your local area. If you just try Google, I, mean, I actually found out through university, so always check your university information center um, and you, you should get information there and it's certainly worth going to because species identification I feel is a really key thing. Now I'll get onto that in a second with my main interest which is birds but it certainly has helped me for insects, trees, plants and obviously increasing uh, my bird ID skills. So on to birds, certainly 2014 helped me advance my birding skills. So I just want to give a few tips that I learned um, throughout the years. I'm still a bit of a novice, but hopefully um, this can help even those who might be experienced because you're always learning, especially those who are beginning and want to get into birding. As it is something where you can get some fresh air, go for some walk and see some extraordinary behavior and also some extraordinary color of birds. Um, for example, jays in this country, robins, starling murmurations you don't have to go abroad to get extraordinary wildlife sites right here in the uk as well so firstly especially with things like gulls and um, songbirds is to look at the feet and beak color because that can give a huge clue song um sound is actually quite an interesting thing to look for obviously birds call and sing so that's if you can test your ear for that, especially if you've got a musical ear. Luckily, I myself have a little bit of that um, from a background of my parents, and it does help. You start if you go out about, so for example, with the Natural History Societies that I mentioned, um, RSPB, you've got the BTO, uh, the Scottish Wildlife Trust here in Scotland, or you've got the National Trust, whether that be the National Trust itself or the National Trust of Scotland, um, and many other groups. If you get out, you will start to pick up certain things, like what, say, for example, a robin call sounds like or a blackbird call, even getting out yourself, and then you can keep developing until you actually know what something like a... I don't know, a herring gull actually sounds like, because a lot of people probably just uh, wave it away and think it just sounds like a gull. Um, but of course, there's many different species of gull, some interesting species of gull that come to this country. Um, another thing is something called the jizz. Yes, that's the unfortunate correct term. I don't know who named it, but uh, if I find out, I'll um, let you know in future weeks. But this is the flight pattern. And obviously you get varying flight patterns in different birds. Um, and also during that flight is uh, the call as well. The most extraordinary one I've heard, which you'd hear abroad, is the zitting zitticola. And how's that for a name? Um, and that produces this zit, zit, zit when it goes along. But if you listen out to skylarks, meadow pipits, they produce um, flight songs when they're, they're flying along. And again, it's about getting out there. Another thing I'd look for is try and find any specific markings. So, for example, a chaffinch is quite good. It's got sort of white underwings. If you look for that, you'll be, um, you might be able to point it to being a chaffinch. Otherwise, apart from that, behaviour is really important. If you see, for example, a dipper or a wagtail from a long way off, they might be bobbing like this up and down and up and down. Anyway, I'll uh, finish that for now and can always come back to it in later weeks if anyone else wants any advice. I'm now going to move on to the final thing I did in the year, so most of that was from early on in the year, um, and I'm sure I'll come back to things from 2014 in later weeks. But just to finish off as um, the first recommendation of the year, which is Barnes Wetland Centre, definitely worth a visit. It's down in London, so if you're ever in London, you just have to get to Hammersmith um, bus station, get the 283 bus, and the last stop is Barnes Wetland Centre. There's an outdoor bit, um, which is actually separate from the captive area, 
which is wetland. It was originally wetland and then has now been changed into an actual reserve, which is an SSI, a triple SI. Um, and that is Site of Special Scientific Interest. Now these sites usually gather quite rare birds. In fact, I saw my first bittern uh, there when I was there around New Year. A lovely bird, um, obviously very well camouflaged, and I'll come, come back to that bird in later weeks. But anyway, definitely worth getting along. You've got great bird heights um, any time of the year. I'm sure you'll get something interesting. You'll find you get wildfowl coming in at this time in winter. And then summer, obviously, you get your summer migrants. But also, there's a great captive collection, and not just of birds. So you get rare geese, such as the nene or the Hawaiian goose. Um, you even get eider there, which you might see off the shores of the UK and other parts of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, even screamers, which are close relative to ducks and geese in the order and xeriforms, are definitely worth looking up. Um, these guys that I saw didn't do much, but um, I'd love to see them out in the wild. Seemed like a really interesting species to find out in South America. Um, but they even have the Asiatic uh, short clawed otter, um, which is a species that has trouble on waterways from agriculture runoff, but also things like dams and um, other industrial works that are uh, polluting rivers, such as we have problems, unfortunately, with our otters in this country. So, anyway, that's my recommendation. But to finish off, each week, um, I'm going to do a random species from Archive, as A-R-K-I-V-E. You probably know the site, you can access information on many different species. And this is going to be, this week is about the white rhinoceros. Now there's two subspecies of white rhinoceros found out in southern Africa. There's the um, northern white rhinoceros, whose numbers are very rare. And the southern white rhinoceros, whose numbers are actually quite vast. Anyway, I'll focus on the northern. Because recently, um, last year, we're now down to five individuals, all found in captivity. The numbers have dropped so highly um, due to poaching, mainly. And this is for, as you probably know, the rhino horn. Now, the rhino horn is literally, it's just, it's hair pretty much. Um, it's, it's made up of keratin, which you find in your nails and in your hair. Um, it's a protein. But supposedly this is useful for aphrodisiac, but also through uh, recently speaking to some people in Chinese medicine and also doing some research. It's actually used for cooling of the blood. However, if there's an alternative, why can't it be found? Because the unfortunate scenario at the moment, as we've seen with only five individuals, that numbers have rapidly decreased. And there is work, which actually one of my lecturers from Napier has been doing out in South Africa and Southern Africa, is to take off the horn of the rhino so that it doesn't entice poachers to actually kill, usually, usually they would kill the animals, unfortunately, which has caused such a sudden decline. So... I'd recommend any time you uh, are abroad or even in this country and see something with rhino horn, uh, whether it be daggers that are especially found in the Middle East, the handles are made of rhino horn, or in the Chinese medicine uh, trade, do not buy it, no matter how much. There's a lot of money that be made um, from this, so if we can hit the demand also the supply of it with the work going out on in Africa and um, we can cut down on trade such as this and other poaching and pet trades that are found around the world which are affecting many species. Anyway I'll finish on that note unfortunately it's a bit of a sour note but there is hope for conservation and hopefully with a lot of work speaking to people as well and finding alternatives it will work and I can follow that on next week. So See you next week, guys. Thank you for listening.